Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. It's a horror anthology series being released daily, two episodes at a time on Netflix. Each episode is about an hour long. The first two, which we're about to discuss, are titled Lot 36 and Graveyard Rats. And one thing that surprised me about Guillermo del Toro is the fact that he's almost like James Gunn in the sense where he is able to get anyone he wants to work on like a TV show or movie and they will like do it right off the bat. I think Guillermo del Toro is more famous than James Gunn. And also that shouldn't surprise you because like he's been in the industry long enough where he has those connections. Yeah, but I even have a game here, and the game is you need to guess the director who did not work on the TV show, and I have the episode that they so worked on. So far, I've on. only seen the two. Though. I understand, but... And I know the directors of the yeah, first two. Yeah, but these aren't the directors of the first two. So you're so asking me to guess... These are for episodes later on that they did, and one of these directors did not work on the show. All the other ones did. Okay. So we have Mandy director, Panos Cosmatos, directed episode seven of this series. Mandy as in the um, Nicholas Cage, Cage movie, movie. yeah. The Babadook director, Jennifer Kent, directed episode eight. All right, Babadook is straight up horror alley, so that feels right. Hereditary director, Ari Aster, directed episode five. Oh, God, five. I hope not. No, he's so busy. It's got to be. That's a trick and question, then, right? A Girl Walks Home Alone on a director, uh, Anna Lily Amrapour, directs episode four. Um, a Girl Who Walks Home at Night. Remind me what movie it's a is. It's a vampire film that came out in, like, 2014 and got critical acclaim. Shoot. Um, so I feel like the Ari one is, is a trap because, like... He is getting famous people, and you just started this off by saying he was able to get whoever he wanted. So that feels like it might be true, but I'm going to go with it because of how much other stuff he's doing. And you would be correct. It was Ari Aster. He nice. did not work on episode five, but all the other people did. And then... Uh, I'm okay with that because the guy can do some disgusting work. <laughs> for the first two episodes that you watched, though, Guillermo Navarro, he was a cinematographer for Pan's Wait, Labyrinth. Guillermo Del Varro? Gu Guillermo Navarro. Is yeah. that like... Oh, Navarro. Navarro. That's him. <laughs> no, he was a cin cinematographer for Pan's Labyrinth, though. He also directed episodes of Hannibal. I think that's just him with a mustache. He did things like Hannibal, Luke Cage, executively produced a lot of Guillermo del Toro's work, Hellboy, Night at the Museum, and Pacific Rim. Wow. And then you have the second episode directed by Vincenzo Natale. He wrote things like Cube, Splice, Nothing, and The Tall Grass. Also Is shows... that really all you know him from? Well, no, no, TV shows as well. No, obviously, we talked about it. Lost so in Space, Westworld, Lock and Key, The Stand, The Peripheral, the first two episodes that we watched. Yeah, we talked yeah. about him in The Peripheral podcast, no, I know. which was really recent. Yeah. So obviously I recognized his name. And the second episode is better than the first. Really? Yeah, no no doubt. The second episode is actually based off of a short story. I thought they both were. The Graveyard Rats. Well, actually, the first episode, Lot 36, was based off of a story that happened actually to Guillermo del Toro himself. He, like, ended up losing storage space because someone Okay, so was he's given... Amelia in the episode. Yeah, he was get... like, someone get... was given the wrong storage thing. They ended up selling all of his stuff, including, sure. like, storyboards for different TV shows and movies, and it took him a while to get it back. The Graveyard Rats, though, was actually, uh, it's been adapted a couple times, but it was, like, published in a magazine, I think, in 1936 by an author who died in 1957. It was a made-for-cable anthology film, Trilogy of Terror 2, written and directed by Dan Curtis, who wrote the 1966 series dark shadows so it's had a little bit of a history but this is like i think the first tv show to actually adapt it yeah and i'll go through the events of what happens in both episodes but first i want to compare this to nightmares and dreamscapes which is that stephen king series from like 2006 because that's very much the anthology type show that we're getting here and stephen king even you on twitter was like everyone should watch Camel the toro's cabinet of curiosities oh i thought he was gonna be like you're copying my format. But no, it's a high production value, famous directors, like you said, Del Toro, Vincenzo, Natali, uh, lots of gore. Um, you could also compare it to like Black Mirror, uh, Love, Death, and Robots, uh, American Horror Stories, Channel Zero, all anthology horror series. And obviously it's coming out in October. Just as like, it doesn't he have a Pinocchio movie coming out yep, pretty soon? I think in December or November. Like a horror yeah. Pinocchio? Yeah, yeah. that'll be pretty cool to see. You've also got the paying homage, like I said, to Alfred Hitchcock, Twilight Zone. Um, and then the title sequence that happens right after the introduction. By the way, it's the first time I think I've ever seen Guillermo del Toro. And he just walks straight <laughs> on screen, a black screen. He's got this weird like um, table setting behind yeah. him. And he just starts talking about it. He turns the figurines, which are the actual directors. But then when we go into a title sequence that reminds me very much of the Room iOS puzzle game. Have you ever the played Room that? iOS yeah. puzzle game? So when uh, I think this was one of the first like big iPhone games that came around. And then it launched on android but it's like where you actually are able to manipulate this um box and like unlock it and then it opens to another box to really <laughs> uh, to reveal another puzzle and it just keeps on going in and if you see the intro and you play that game you'll you'll notice the connections almost immediately but yeah so let's just jump into the episodes first one lot 36 right yeah 
It's the early 90s. George H.W. Bush is on the television screen. We have Nick. He's listening to some conservative radio. He's a, he's a dirtbag. <laughs> he owes money to some goons. He's desperate and he treats everyone like shit. Uh, he's also like a war vet. Um, he's at this dilapidated storage facility and he makes money buying foreclosed and abandoned units mm -hmm. at auction and then selling anything he can of value that he can salvage. And okay. then uh, one such unit is lot 36. So that's the basis, that's the setting of what the episode is going to be. You said there was a character named Emily? Amelia. And Amelia's role, she comes along a little bit later, but I can tell you what happens. Uh, Nick, since he buys all these different units, right, he bought her unit, even though she was still paying for it. Okay. And so the owner of the facility, who's not Nick, ended up screwing up and selling her unit by mistake. Nick so buys that's it. just straight up this. I thought that he was going to change it in some way. Nick, no, Nick bought that unit, sold all the stuff. And when the, and Amelia shows up, all she wants to do is go into the unit and see if there's anything that she can still use. Right. And he says, there's only a few bits of crap in there, but you have to pay me to use it or otherwise fuck you and also fuck immigrants because she's foreign. So he's just an asshole to her. It's pushing a political message at all? Yeah, it starts off talking about how, like, again, conservative radio and just he's upset with his life. And okay. so he blames everyone else. So back to Lot 36. The person who died and used to own it, right? We see him in the first scene. He's this disgusting old fellow who would enter the unit each day with a bag of chopped up skin rodents and then leave with an empty bag. So that he, clearly he was feeding something. Yeah. Yes. And so Nick doesn't care. He goes into the unit. He starts rooting around for anything he can find. He finds evidence that the guy, the really disgusting guy, was a Nazi sympathizer. And we learn more about that later on. But he also finds some pretty interesting things, some antiques, a candelabra, which, like, think of Lumiere from The Beauty and the Beast, but, like, if he was dead. And, I, yeah, I saw a ton of pictures for this episode in particular, and I saw the candelabra that you're talking about. Yeah, and then he also finds some, like, antique chairs. He finds an old reef. Uh, and then he finds this strange table slab. He also finds that the unit is kind of shorter than the rest of the units and he's like well what's up with that but uh while loading up his car he gets jumped by the people he owes money to and he gets his windshield smashed and so he owes 12k that's what we learn right okay but then the owner of the facility says hey you can use my appraiser so he goes to the appraiser it's nighttime by now and she calls upon a demon expert guy because the table that he brought in is actually a 19th century seance table that has valuable books hidden inside now there are three books and they're all like latin and they're like obviously used for summoning rituals and stuff but the demon expert says they're actually sold in a pack of four and if he <laughs> has that fourth book it's actually worth it goes from ten thousand dollars worth of books to three hundred thousand dollars worth of books and and so obviously Nick's like, we got to find that last book. And so the demon expert man and him both jump into the truck that's got the broken <laughs> windshields and drive back to the unit, right? Yeah. And while they're doing that, the demon expert man says, I actually know a lot about this apartment and who owned it. So this guy, they made the, all their money, their family did, by selling a bunch of stolen goods after World War II. They also sold weapons to the Nazis or something. They were just bad people. Mm -hmm. Also, the guy's sister had gone missing at some point this uh, socialite called Dottie Wilmar and people believe that he had used her as a vessel for like some demon and the, the guy just knows this all right and just randomly yeah he's like I them. actually know the unit that you bought and I know where these <laughs> books are from and everything like that but let's go in there and let's be safe and Nick's like I don't care I just I don't believe any of this crap I just want to get my money right yeah. so they get back to the unit they find out that the back portion of the unit is fake that's why it's so short they open that up and it's hiding a tomb and so they start walking down the tomb. They hold the candelabra high so that it like protects them. And what do they find? They find this big demon circle. You know, those ones that you see in like Supernatural. Yeah. And in the middle of the demon circle is like this dead body with its face caved in. And that's Dottie Wilmar. But the thing in her face is alive. There's like this octopus thing that's like crawling around. And so like... <laughs> he seems to like to do a lot of monster things. Yes, it's definitely a monster. And also there's a bunch of crucifixes that line the sides and with newspaper articles. So it's very creepy. But Nick in his blindness i guess just doesn't notice the living octopus in this girl's face and decides i'm just gonna walk right through the circle and pick up the book which is just laying there on the oh, side yeah, right yeah and so he just like breaks the circle which the demon expert obviously sees as an issue and starts screaming and he grabs the book and he turns around and that's when obviously the octopus lady wakes up bursts through the body it becomes half octopus uh like the the full legs are there 
Yeah. But everything else is oh, an octopus that's, yeah. or like tentacle monster thing. Sorry. And it eats the priest. So the candelabra did jack shit. <laughs> <laughs> and so then Nick goes running around the storage facility looking for a way out while this evil <laughs> demon thing starts chasing him, right? And so it's it's kind of funny. But then he gets to one of those doors where it's like he could finally find a way out. And that's where Amelia's standing on the other side of the door, kind of just being like, oh, you want me to let you out? No, I'm not going to do that. So I'm, she says so she's actually evil. No, she's not evil. She's just pissed off at him. He oh, he was just a jerk to her. And I she's mean, like, oh, you could use my help? Okay, no, I'm just going to walk but away. But the fact that she, she's going to she let him She had decided die. to stay there for like eight hours just hanging out, doing nothing. So she just was at the unit, and I don't even know why. So really. Nick, Nick is screwed, basically. No, Nick just gets eaten at that point. And that's the end of the episode. He just dies? And yes, that's he it? just dies. Scumbag just dies. That's the end of the episode. And I'll get to my feelings on that after I describe the second episode, which is called Graveyard Rats. Yes. Vincenzo Natali. Which, again, the figurines that they introduce these guys with are funny because it's like, how much time did they really spend on... How much money and time did they spend on making these guys just yeah. to, just for one little moment of uh, audience sake? Well, it's funny you say that because I know that Guillermo del Toro said one of the biggest challenges was turnaround time. They would shoot, I think, each episode for about three or four weeks, and then it was crazy because the set designs had to, like, make all new sets. And, and the set they designs had, are great. Yeah. They, they are. This, this place looked both scary but also like oh that's kind of an interesting storage facility it just looked really cheap but also broken down and like there were problems with it but it made the perfect atmosphere and the last time we did a storage facility episode was like little voice and that thing was pristine and it took place in new york i i need she used to, to play the piano in there I, I you're probably about to you were just talking about Guillermo del toro's intros and i remember bj novak said in one of his premises episodes i think it was the finale one he, he made a joke he was like it doesn't really matter people are what i say People are going to see me and they're just going to be like, oh, it's cool that BJ Novak showed up. Is that what it's kind of like with Guillermo del Toro? Because it doesn't feel like he's actually adding anything to the story. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what would be the worst way to die? That's my way of introducing this episode. Having a roof above you collapse while you're laying in a bed because of all the rats on the upper floor. A mm -hmm. zombie chasing and eating you. Rats eating you from the inside out. Or one giant wolf-sized rat eating you. <laughs> being buried alive in a coffin or falling a hundred feet into a pit of skeletal remains. You know, I actually read the short story. Yeah, so, so I'm asking you, which would, which would be worst way to die? I mean, the giant rat one seems terrifying. I don't want to be scared before I die. And I feel like the the even though those are all scary situations, the giant rat one may, might be the scariest. I'd have to go with rats eating you from the inside out. Eh, yeah. But all of these things basically happen to this dude. This guy named Masson. Oh, okay. And I didn't even get to the fact that he could have died from an infection from shooting himself in the foot. And it's 1919. And also being crushed alive while crawling through an underground tunnel. Uh, claustrophobic. All, all this stuff. Yeah, all this stuff is in the short story. So yeah, I would be claustrophobic it. in any sort of tunnel. I would never follow anything into a tunnel. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it, it all basically starts with this guy named Masson. Um, I, it's, I'm just gonna call him Mason, I think, because okay. like, it's hard to say my son a, a bunch of times. I'm not used to it. Um, but it's Salem, Massachusetts, 1919, our main man, Mason, he owes some money to some goons. Yeah. Is that a big surprise? Right. It just seems like last episode. Yeah. He normally makes a living grave robbing from this cemetery that he actually owns or that he upkeeps. And the first scene is him, uh, stopping these two young grave robbers, only to then take the items for himself. Like he doesn't call the cops on them. He shoots a gun just to scare them off. And then he takes the riches for himself. He particularly likes to find gold plated teeth because those are worth a lot. Yeah. So people who have cavities and then like have them filled in <laughs> with gold. Um, but when he's like taking out for this one, like 19 year olds, like. Oh, gold, do you have to hear the sound? You get to see the maggots in the eyes, oh. which they like to show a lot. A rat comes out and bites him. And this rat is like gr grungy looking. It's got like a missing eyeball and it, it bites him. And I'm like, oh, is he going to die from infection from that as well? But no, he actually uses it as an excuse to tell the collector, the debt person that he owes the money to, right? that he needs more time because these rats are getting in the way of everything. They're like stealing <laughs> the bodies from him and stuff. And so we're just like, okay, well, he, this guy is obviously desperate and he's living in a time where you would not want to be desperate. Um, <laughs> and so with a limited time to get a big score, he goes to a mortician played by Julian Richings, 
the death guy from Supernatural. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ichabod Crane from Patriot. Yeah, he's a gaunt-looking dude, and there's a quick little interaction where the guy's addicted to drugs, so he sells some drugs, and that's what leads the... Or it might have just been alcohol, but I think it was drugs. Um, but yeah, Mason Yeah, because this goes would have been Prohibition, back. right? 1919, you Yes, so Mason goes to the back where they show all the bodies. He's looking for more teeth, right? So he goes to this... <laughs> He goes through all the dead bodies, which are really gross looking because some of them have drowned. Yeah. And like their skin has become all messy and stuff. But then he finds one perfect body. And it's like this rich sea merchant who has just passed away and he has a ton of gold teeth. Must have like not brushed at all because they're all gold. <laughs> and he's so happy about this. And then he like sits in the corner waiting as the widow comes in and talks about all these riches that he's going to be buried with. And he's like, this is going to be the payday that I need, including the saber that he was like gifted by this famous guy. Right. Wow. So, lot of stuff. OK. Yeah. 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 So he, he actually endorses the but he goes to the uh, funeral. He's the one that they're burying it in his cemetery and he waits till the nighttime and he's licking his chops, waiting until this thing is over to dig up the body. And then as soon as he gets to the coffin and he's knocking on it or he's he's listening to it, he hears the, the rats inside mm -hmm. the coffin. He's like, oh, no, they don't. And he rips it open just as he sees the feet being pulled into this secret tunnel <laughs> that the rats have dug through the cab uh, the coffin case into the like, and you said you read the story to this. So this is shouldn't yeah, surprise well, you. I mean, it, it wasn't exactly like this. I think what uh, what the main character lost wasn't like gold teeth. I think it was like a, a pearl. It was something pretty small. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. OK, so anyways, he's trying to follow this body and all the riches that are with it. Right. Yeah. And so he's like, I can either go back with nothing and then be, get beat up or like buried in a coffin by these like evil dudes who I owe money to or I can follow these rats. So that's what he does. He follows the rats into this intricate path of tunnels, kind of like an ant farm, you know, and he's going down and through and stuff and things are collapsing and he's trying, he's narrowly avoiding like death all the time until finally something does collapse on him, stopping him from being able to move forward or backwards and the rats then start running at him, right? And that's where he has to like try to dig his way out and then he pulls out his gun and he shoots one of the rats, but he misses and hits his foot. Very, yeah, that's, that's from the short story, yeah. Yeah, and then the one rat that had bit him in the first scene actually shows up again it's and the it's, same rat yeah because he's got that grungy like eyeball thing going yeah. and that's what he shoots that rat to death Hold like on. he just like it explodes this reminds me a lot and and even when i was reading the short story reminded me of the love death and robots season three episode with the yes. rats in the farm and i will compare it to that i actually have a great comparison to that but i have to wait till the ending right so the shooting wakes up the mama rat and the mama rat <laughs> is like a muskrat, but way bigger. So you're thinking like wolf-sized rat, right? Yeah. It's bigger than the princess bride rat. And so wow. it wakes up, it's blind, but it's deadly. And he it runs towards him, it's able to sniff him out. And then uh, he shoots it, doesn't matter, this thing is too big for that to count. And uh, it scratches him and he falls like 500 feet through one of the tunnels into this skeletal like remains of bodies. And he calls it a black church because apparently like he knew about these places that used to like hundreds of years beforehand. It was like a ritual for these people. Mm -hmm. But guess what's down there with all the skeletons? all the valuables rings earrings necklaces so it's like so oh, he just man. starts loading up <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's it's the perfect thing that he needs so he starts loading up on everything and then he sees on the wall this engraving and the engraving is actually of the monster from the first episode oh, that, okay. that like demon tongue thing yeah. you know and so then he looks over where it's like facing and it's facing this one zombie looking lady or guy and uh he he goes over to it and he sees this necklace gem that looks very expensive and he pulls it off the thing only to wake it up and then it starts yelling mine mine and it starts like jumping at him and i don't stuff. think the, i don't think the zombie in the short story speaks i might be remembering that it only know. says mine and he he could have just given it back <laughs> honestly that's what i keep asking myself had he just yeah, he had all that other stuff. It. yes i don't think it wanted the other stuff it's not like uh what's what's the name of the dragon in bilbo's thing where like it wants all smog, its gold, smog, smog. smog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where where you need to keep all the gold there. I think it only wanted this one gem. Anyways, though, he keeps the gem, he keeps everything. He starts climbing back up the hole that he fell in. He doesn't actually seem too worse for where he just looks really gross because he's been in this tunnel and he's got blood and everything on him. And so he goes up to the front, but that's where he gets trapped between the zombie person and then the rat. Mm -hmm. And he he's he's stuck. So then the rat starts charging him and he sees this giant boulder ahead of him and he's like pulls it from the top and it comes loose just as the rat's about to get him 
and it stuffs the rat, it smushes it, it dies, right? Yes. But it also causes the collapse of the part of the rest of the tunnel, which stops the zombie from being able to get through. And so only its hand is able to be like, mine, mine. And again, he could have just returned it at that <laughs> point. But then he still has his riches. He looks up further and he sees a glint from light and he's like all right well that's where i gotta go and so then he makes his way to the top thinking he's about to get to the daylight and then what is it it's metal glinting off the the flashlight which he has which is cool that they had flashlights in 1919 i didn't know that so but he finds out that the metal is actually the interior of a coffin like one of his yes. regular coffins yeah. He's stuck in there, and that's when the rest of the rat family decides to join in, and they get all over him, and they eat him from the inside out. that's the end, right? It's not the end, because that's when the young gravediggers, a little time later, uh, because his body's still fresh, open up the thing, see him, say, oh, man, it's the guy from the first scene. And and then right as they're about to start taking some of the gold that he's with, like, because he's uh, he's still got the gems and stuff, um, that's when, like, his his cheeks start bulging and the rats start coming out of his his mouth because they've been eating him from the inside so that last part was definitely added on there was some differences but for the most part it seems like that was almost just straight up a like well horror but also just like very keeping very faithful to the actual short story himself Guillermo del Toro had an interview with Mike Flanagan because they're both coming out with shows (laughs) on Netflix yeah the Haunting Uh, of Hill House guy yeah you can tell Mike Flanagan like he was even wearing a Guillermo del Toro shirt like he really really likes the dude and uh, wait does he direct one of the episodes no oh that would yeah. be so cool again he's doing his own show it's i think it's already out at this point but Gamble del toro said to mike flanagan he was like i am very much one for aesthetics with horror stories sure. but i am not one that like really is into the mechanics of it mm. and i was wondering if like you agreed if that was kind of what it was like with the. well he only episodes. did the first episode right and then uh when he he, he wrote the first episode um and he, he wrote directed the, he didn't direct the first episode. No, he said it, he directed it. No, right? the guy who directed the first episode was a cinematographer of Pan's Labyrinth, Guillermo oh! Navarro. <laughs> so when he introduced, he didn't introduce himself. He introduced, that yeah. was that little figurine. <laughs> yeah. I heard Guillermo and I thought he was talking about himself. Wow, I really should have listened till the end. And then he also wrote the last episode as well. So he wrote two episodes for this show. Okay, that makes more sense now. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll go through the pros and cons. Pros are that it's horrific, it's disgusting, uh, but it's also funny and just ridiculous enough not to be too much of the first two things. Because if you're seeing something that's overly horrific and disgusting, you won't want to watch it, you know? But it's like, it's October, it's Halloween month. I think people will enjoy this. David Hewlett does a great job in that second role as Mason, um, fighting for his life. It's very believable. And then he's also able in other scenes to just talk someone's ear off. Uh, and then like the settings were cool. We addressed that Salem as a place to set your stuff from 1919, kind of like, uh, new Orleans with interview from the vampire. Like those are places that have a lore behind them and, uh, the storage facility being in disrepair. I like the different director idea. Um, those are my pros. The cons are that there's absolutely no character development from Nick or Mason. Mm. Nick is a huge scumbag throughout the entire episode Mason is a desperate, selfish fool throughout the entire episode. And like you were talking about with the Love, Death, and Robots rat episode. Yeah. In 10 minutes, they were able to do a man versus rats thing where there was more evolution of the characters in that than there was in an hour long of this. So that makes me sad. Like, honestly, the way the first story ended, I really, really disliked the first episode. It built up so much and it was solid build up just to just have the guy die at the end. And there was nothing to it. He didn't learn anything. <laughs> it was, it felt like you're you telling me that Guillermo, was it Navarro or Del Toro? Which one was the one who, he wrote it though. Del Toro wrote it. Del Toro wrote it, Because yeah. he was based off him seeing someone be a, a jerk. Mm-hmm. Like way to write just the guy dying. Like yeah, what yeah. was the whole point of telling us all about this? It could have been half the time length. And I guess I still would have feel, well, felt just, unsatisfied. By there's the no ending. point to the story is what you're saying. I'm saying that. And I'm also saying that both stories were actually the same. So a guy owes money to blank. He makes a living taking dead people's valuables. He finds himself in a desperate position where the only way to pay off his debt is to do something dangerous. He enters a hidden path or tomb to find evil awaiting and then he dies getting the thing that he wants so he, he the guy got the book in the first episode and then it burned up and the, this guy got the gems kind of a la to the all the books in the world style but then his glasses break from yeah, twilight zone right of course but they're the same story 
Like I did, this is, I, the second one is way better. I, I enjoyed the, 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 the action and the adventure to it. And I knew that the guy was going to die, but at the same time, it, this, at least with Mason, like he seemed redeemable in a certain respect. Like I, I actually felt bad for him a lot of the time because if you're a grave digger in 1919, like medical school students used to grave dig and rob because they needed to study those cadavers. Yeah. It wasn't a great profession, but it wasn't frowned upon to the, like, I don't see if he has to do that to make a living and survive and he's not hurting anyone. The Nick guy is just an asshole to everyone. Mason is less so. Yeah, I, I think he's just a little greedy. I don't think he deserved all the shit that got thrown his way. So I, I don't know. It, 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 it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But this, at the same time, second episode, way better than the first. I would give the second episode probably a uh, seven or an eight. The first episode, like a five. I think that on IMDb, the first episode has a 6.8 and the second episode has a 7.3. But I can get to the reviews. Mm-hmm. Overall, there's about a thousand reviews on IMDb. It has an 8.1, 95% on Ron Tomatoes. The Guardian gave the show five out of five stars. Writing about the first episode, Blake Nelson is phenomenal, playing all the bitterness and selfishness of his fastest brainwashing. About the second episode, pause, said, pause right there though. He he's not. He's playing a one note character, and he's just not doing like uh, he's playing the role that he's been written for. Right. But like that role is nothing. Like he's just being a dick and he doesn't, he's monotoned about it. And he doesn't, the part that strikes me the weirdest is like, if the message is don't be a dick, right? There's nothing that shows uh, like why. Neither of them had another option as far as how they were going to get their money. You might agree with what they said about the second episode, though. They said the journey through the tunnels is utterly foul and heart-stoppingly stressful. Yes, stressful. Yeah, and then New York Times said, Tim Blake Nelson gives an engaging performance. You wait with some interest to see the punchline, but there isn't one. Really just some latex nastiness. Uh, and it, that was kind of a middling review that they were talking about. However, it seemed like the New Yorker compared it, and they, they, it was a positive review, to Barbarian, Zach Kreger's. Oh, you know, movie. yeah, yeah. At one point, it did remind me of Barbarian. Um, you're talking about the first episode? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot exactly where it was, but I, I think it's when they maybe opened up the hidden chamber in the bottom, because mm-hmm. there's something similar that happens in the movie. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, so that's that's probably it. Yeah, and then the Indie Wire, they said that you might have some visceral shivers with something like the Graveyard Rats, but overall they weren't a huge fan of the first two episodes and they gave it a C minus. See, I would I would almost agree with that, but the second episode I, I did think about it and I was like, Well, this did gross me out and there were some funny parts like the fact that he would go to his deck collector and be like, The rats are stealing the bodies and even I was like at the point because I, I had only seen him gotten bitten by a rat. Could you ever see any of Guillermo del Toro's work be turned into a musical? Yeah, absolutely. No, in fact, I think there's something that I read yes, about this. Yes. Um, I forgot what it is, though. Okay, well, uh, December 2012 it came out that Pan's Labyrinth is going to be made into a musical on Broadway. And actually, the script for it has already been written by Guillermo del Toro himself. They even got Paul Williams, who helped write... Is it in production hell right now? Like, is it 10 years? I think so, okay. yeah. But they actually got Paul Williams, who helped write Rainbow Connection with Jim Hempson and composer Gustavo Santanolia. He's won, like, two Academy Awards. Mm-hmm. So it seems like that's going to be coming out in the next couple of years. Sure. Which I guess, I like, Pan's Labyrinth being a musical, it's odd because I can't imagine it, but it's also, out of all of his work, probably the one that makes the most sense to turn into a musical yeah and i mean they've been turned a lot of weird things into musicals i think the bowie um uh what was that that movie the man who fell to earth or whatever i think there was some like continuation of that that was a musical spider-man's a musical uh i mean they could attach lin-manuel miranda and just have him help (laughs) out with this like i I could see him getting into horror a lin-manuel miranda horror movie that'd be cool (laughs) i do know that david hewlett was in shape of water and I wasn't a big sh- fan of Shape of Water. Yeah, but, but it, like, it wasn't. It wasn't that has to be the last like Guillermo del Toro movie that I've seen. I think. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not sure if he's come out with anything. Does so. that make sense to anybody? Like the the plot to Shape of Water, how like in the end we're just supposed to accept that she falls in love with this fish. <laughs> if anybody else has a problem with that, just just let me know. Because I feel like I'm alone. But we can end it there. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.